So in our first part we discussed Craster, and how his child's sacrifice to the others seemed to be condoned and supported by the Night's Watch. And in our second part, we examine the parallels to another point in history where the Night's Watch participated in child sacrifice to the others with the Night's King. And in our third part, we discussed how this child sacrifice to the others was a regular practice of the Night's Watch in the North from the building of the Wall and enduring until modern times, though there was perhaps a hiccup in the practice occurring around the time of Queen Alysanne. And in this part, we discussed how the Lord's right to the first night was an integral part of child sacrifice, creating the babies to be offered. But there is one big question with this whole practice. If child sacrifice was condoned not just by the Night's Watch, but by the North as well, and the Lord's right to the first night was all part of this, why wasn't the Night's King's sacrifices tolerated? What was specifically wrong with his situation? And why was Craster's situation fine? Well, to answer this, we'll have to step back and tackle the subject of genetics and how one becomes a telepath. That is, genetically, how does one become a warg, skin changer, or green seer? Now before we begin, I am often asked if George R. Martin really thinks about genetics. He is no scientist after all. No, he isn't. Though he is a sci-fi writer who literally wrote dozens of stories where genetics and genetic engineering played a significant role. Anyone who's read Tough Voyaging, or Night Flyers, or Star Lady, or Dark Dark Where the Tunnels, or In the House of the Worm, or Bitter Blooms, or Dying of the Light, knows this. Not to mention, there's Wild Cards, a book series that George R. R. Martin has been editing for 30 years that's entire premise is about an alien virus that alters DNA and then becomes a recessive gene. There's an entire chapter in the first Wild Cards book that describes how this recessive gene gives someone superpowers. Now granted, George R. R. Martin didn't write this section, he was only the editor, but in the next Wild Card book, George R. R. Martin did write a story called Winter's Chill where the rules of the Wild Card gene are applied. The great and powerful turtle, a man with telekinesis, is thinking about having children with his girlfriend, a seemingly normal woman, but he runs into a serious barrier as both he and his girlfriend carry the wildcard gene. This should put to rest the question of whether or not George R. R. Martin thinks about genetics. Bar, she's normal, I tell you, a gnat. She got it when she was two, damn it. It's like it never happened. It happened, Tachyon said. She may appear normal, but the virus is still there. Latent. Most likely it will never manifest, and genetically it's recessive. But when you and she have- I know a lot of people think I'm a joker, Tom interrupted. But I'm not, believe me, I'm an ace. I'm an ace, damn it. So what if the kid carries the wildcard gene? So he'll have Major League Teak. He'll be an ace, like me. No, Tachyon said. He slid the photographs back into the file folder, his eyes averted from the cameras. Deliberately? I'm sorry, my friend. The odds against that are astronomical. Cyclone! Tom had said, on the edge of hysteria. Cyclone was a West Coast ace, whose daughter had inherited his command of the winds. No, said Tachyon. Mistral is a special case. We're almost certain now that her father somehow subconsciously manipulated her germ plasma while she was still in the womb. On Takis, well, this process is not unknown to us, but it rarely succeeds. You're the most powerful telekineticist I've ever seen. But something like that depends on a fine control that is in the orders of magnitude beyond you. Not to mention centuries of experience in microsurgery and gene splicing. And even if you had all of that, you'd probably fail. Cyclone had no idea what he was doing on any conscious level, and he was freakishly lucky on top of it. The Tachesian shook his head. Your case is entirely different. All that's guaranteed is that you'll be drawing a wild card, and the odds are just the same as if... I know the odds. Tom said hoarsely. Of every hundred humans dealt the wild card, only one developed ace powers. There were ten hideously malformed jokers for every ace, and ten black queen deaths for every joker. Now, this passage is rather incredible in that it not only shows that, yes, George R. R. Martin thinks about genetics a lot, but it also shows the massive, almost comical degree he will go to plug a plot hole. Keep in mind, Cyclone and Mistral are not major characters in the Wild Card series, and them being related is not very significant at all. However, George R. R. Martin wrote a throwaway line about Cyclone's child inheriting his powers in the first Wild Card's book, which contradicted what a different author wrote about the nature of the virus in that same book. And so George R. R. Martin actually wrote a paragraph about the subconscious telekinetic manipulation of germ plasma in order to fix this. That's the kind of writer he is. With that put to rest, it is notable how similar genetics is in Wild Cards as compared with Ice and Fire. In Wild Cards, genetics plays with percentages. 
1 in 10 a malformed joker, 1 in 100 an ace. In ice and fire, 1 in 1,000 a skin changer, 1 in a million a green seer. In wild cards, we find that the gene can be there, but dormant, only to be activated by trauma. And of course, we know this to be true of skin changing as well. Bran's advancement was helped by falling and being in a coma, and then later by being in darkness and cold in the crypts, and then assisted more by psychotropic drugs. And in wild cards, we find that the gene can be expressed a bit differently from individual to individual. The same can be said of telepathic genes in Ice and Fire. While some skin changers seem to have the ability to telepathically enter animals, Arya seems to be gaining the ability to change her face. And then there's the communication with others through dreams, or the ability to travel through time. And if Danny is genetically similar, the ability to ride dragons. With the others, the ability to animate the dead. Of course, skin changing was never a virus as far as we know, and doesn't kill 90% of offspring and leave 9% with horrible mutations. So clearly there are differences. But let's get on to the question of what is the genetic nature of skin changing? How expressive is it? Is it dominant or recessive? Is it a sex-linked gene or not? These are some tough questions to answer, but we will try to do our best. So first off, we should talk about when and how skin changing is expressive. One of the most important things to remember about skin changing is that it's often dormant. Like the wildcard gene, it requires some sort of trauma to activate it. And even if activated, it's expressed in various degrees, rather than being binary. So even if one is genetically a skin changer, one may not express the ability or may not express it to a noticeable extent. For example, George R. Martin has specifically told us that all the Stark children are skin changers, but we have not seen Sansa definitively express any ability yet. This is likely due to the fact that she has no direwolf. For some reason, spending time with an animal in close proximity, a dog in the case of Vermeer Sixskins, helps the telepathic gift awaken. Not that a canine is necessarily needed, darkness and psychotropic drugs also seem to trigger an awakening of latent abilities, as we see with Bran and Arya. Of course, with dormant skin changers out there, this makes tracking the ability on a family tree rather difficult. Who's to say who is secretly a carrier passing a gene down? Related to this, all the Stark children are skin changers, and yet we saw no such abilities in either Cat or Ned. So either both of them carried recessive genes, and it was a huge coincidence that all five children got them, extremely unlikely, a 0.01% chance, or the genes of Cat and Ned were dormant. So besides being a dormant gene that needs activation, there is also the question of whether or not skin changing is a sex-linked gene. That is, is it on the X or Y chromosome, or is it on one of the non-sex-linked chromosomes? I bring this up because sex and gender plays not just a huge role in our story, but a huge role in sacrificing to the others. We should note that Craster only gives boys to the others, never girls, and Craster's wives speak of the others being Craster's sons, not his daughters. Likewise, only men have ruled Winterfell for 8,000 years, so it seems that the practicer of the Lord's Right to the First Night must also be a male. Additionally, the Night's Watch, the Overseers of Sacrifice, must always be male, with the story of the Night's King's Queen and Danny Flint appearing to be cautionary tales of females being in the wrong place. Now, if the skin-changing gene were sex-linked and on the Y chromosome, we could conclude that the practice of sacrificing to the others was all about giving that special Stark gene to the others through the Y chromosome. Men pass on their Y chromosome to their sons, Thus, a lord's right to the first knight offering to the others would contain the Y chromosome of the lord, who historically have been skin-changing Starks. But alas, we know that this is not the case. Skin-changing is not Y-linked, as the Starks seem to have gotten their abilities from marrying daughters historically, and of course, Arya is a female. She's a skin-changer and has no Y chromosome. Not to mention, skin-changing being Y-linked would not explain the problem with the Night's King's Queen or Danny Flint. So, perhaps skin-changing is the reverse. Perhaps it's linked to the X chromosome. If this were the case, the Lord's Right to the First Knight would be interesting. It would be an enormous trick on the others. The special Stark skin-changing gene would never pass to the sacrificed boy, as men can only give their X chromosome to daughters and not sons. If a son, by chance, were a skin-changer, it would have to be from the mother. Now, if skin-changing were X-linked, it would explain the crimes of the Night's King quite well. Passing his sons to the others by a regular woman would be fine for 13 years, as no special gene would make it to the others, as he only passes wise. But if he chose to have children with his daughter, a woman with a special gene, that would ensure half of his subsequent sons would get an ex from her and would be skin changers. Meanwhile, Craster, if the son of Bloodraven, would have no special genes from him and would pass nothing special to the others, unless his wife was special. 
This would explain why Craster was tolerated by the Night's Watch, but the Night's King was not. Now I am a big fan of the X-Link telepathic gene idea, as it melds with a series I did three years ago on Targaryen lineage and the ability to ride and hatch dragons. Not to mention, X-Link's genes come up in a video I did on Ramsay not being Roose's son. However, there is one little snag with the X-Link theory, and that is Veramir Six Skins. Veramir was a skin changer who had many children, and yet none of his children had his gift. If skin changing is X-Linked, Veramir's daughters should be skin changers. And yet he says that none of his children had the gift, not just the boys. That's odd. Yes, it's possible that many of them were dormant, but it's unlikely that all of the children were dormant, as one would think that at least one family would own a dog or something. So what is there to make of Veramir's ungifted children? Now there is an explanation for this, and we'll come back to the X-Linked gene idea. But first, let's explore the alternative. Let's suppose that the gene is not sex-linked. Now, if not sex-linked, the next question to ask is whether or not the gene is dominant or recessive. Now, if dominant, half of Vermeer's children should be skin changers. And yet we find this is not the case. This is like a brown-eyed person having children with a dozen blue-eyed people and having none of the children be brown-eyed. Yes, some of his children may be dormant, but one would expect at least a few to show his abilities. And so we can say with some confidence that the skin-changing gene is not dominant. And so the go-to reason why Veramir's children would not be skin changers is that the gene is recessive. If none of the women that Veramir had sex with had the skin changing gene, we actually would expect none of his children to be talented. This is like a blue-eyed person having children with brown-eyed people in a brown-eyed population. We wouldn't expect many, if any, of the children to have blue eyes. However, recessive genes have some problems when we go over to look at the Starks. Let's suppose that both Ned and Kat carry a single recessive skin changing gene. The problem is, all five of their children ended up special. This is like a brown-eyed person and another brown-eyed person having five blue-eyed children. Technically it's possible, but it's highly, highly unlikely. A 0.01% chance. So let's now suppose that Ned was double recessive and Cat was single recessive. With all five children being special, this is like a brown-eyed person and a blue-eyed person having all blue-eyed children. Again, possible, but still very unlikely. A 3% chance. Really, if one is going down the recessive gene path, one has to accept that both Ned and Cat were double recessive. That is, like a blue-eyed person having children with another blue-eyed person and having five blue-eyed children. A sure thing. And yet, unlike blue eyes, skin changing is supposed to be rather rare. Bloodraven says that only one man in a thousand is born a skin changer. And yet we hear of Ned's sister and brother having exceptional abilities with horses on the Stark side, and Sweet Robin showing abilities on the Tully side. This would imply Rickard Stark and his wife Liara were also double recessive. And this would mean that House Stark, House Locke, House Flint, House Tully, House Went, and House Aaron were all carriers of this gene. Not to mention Jon Snow. It's just a lot of special genes floating around. That said, recessive genes would explain a lot of the weird practices of the Night's Watch. With the Lord's Rite of the First Night, a Stark and a non-Stark would be having a child, usually resulting in only one recessive gene, thus depriving the others of a telepath. And with male-only sacrifices, this ensures the others never breed. However, in this case, there would be no difference between the Night's King and Craster. Craster, if Bloodraven's son, would be producing skin changers through his incest both men would be equally intolerable as they would be giving over double recessives. And on top of this, a simple recessive gene wouldn't explain Bran. Bran is described as super special, a one in a million over a one in a thousand. If skin changing were as simple as being a recessive gene, Rob, Rickon, Arya, and Sansa would be just as special as Bran. And so we seem to be stuck. X-linked genes alone don't explain Veramir's children, and recessive genes alone doesn't explain the massive prevalence of telepaths. Not to mention it doesn't explain all the gender references in our story, or the difference between Craster and the Night's King. And of course, there's the special nature of Bran. However, I will say that there is one condition that does help explain everything. A Song of Ice and Fire is a tale of royalty, with certain families displaying certain traits, and the story does contain quite a bit of incest. And of course, this is meant to mirror history, where the royal families were inbred and did display certain traits. Egyptian royal inbreeding produced elongated skulls, cleft palates, and clubbed feet. Habsburg inbreeding produced large jaws and mental retardation. But the disorder that's most significant to our discussion is hemophilia, made famous by the descendants of Queen Victoria. Hemophilia is an X-linked genetic disorder that affects the clotting of blood. 
It usually expresses itself in males because a second X chromosome will compensate for the condition in females, though sometimes females are partially affected. To be a fully affected female hemophiliac, one must have either a malfunctioning X or be double X, a much rarer situation. So if we assume that skin changing functions in a similar fashion to hemophilia, we can go back to Vermeer to see how things would play out. As we can see, none of his boys would be telepaths because they would only get a Y from him. The girls, though, would get an X. However, because the girls have a second X, they do not have any telepathic abilities, or at least have such reduced telepathic abilities that Vermeer doesn't notice. Now let's go over to the Stark children. First, let's talk about the daughters. If Ned had one affected X gene, and Cat had one affected X gene, probability-wise, one would expect one daughter to be double X and have abilities, and one daughter to be single X and either have no abilities or reduced abilities. Ned would always pass his affected X to a daughter, while Cat would have a 50% chance on which X she would pass. And this is essentially what we find. Arya has abilities, while Sansa has either no or reduced abilities. The boy's situation is a little more unusual. There's only a 13% chance that all three sons would have inherited Cat's special gene. Still, 13% is better odds than anything we've seen so far. Of course, if we assume Cat is double X, everything becomes 100% for the children. And yes, that depends on House Tully, Went, and Flint being carriers of special genes, but that's half as many families as required for a non-sex-linked gene. Sweet Robin, for example, would only need to get his gene from his mother. And of course, if we assume that Cat is only single X, then we can eliminate either House Tully or House Went as a source of genes. Again, it's not that we eliminate unusual circumstances in our story, but we reduce them significantly with sex-linked genes. One other big thing that points to skin changing acting like hemophilia is that skin changing does seem to be more prevalent in males. When Vermeer visits a group of skin changers, he finds warg wolf brothers the most prevalent. There's also Borak with his boar, Orel with his eagle, Hagen who brought him, but there's only two females present in the group. Briar with her shadow cat and Grisella with her goat. And the historical legends are the same. Men who control wolves were the most common. If not sex-linked, there should be an equal number of male and female skin changers, yet that's not what we find. And of course, being more prevalent in males would explain the sacrificing situation to the others perfectly. The others would desire boys as telepathic abilities manifest in them more often. But because of the X-linked gene, the special element of skin changing in men would only pass to daughters. There is a certain gender-based irony to this. A group is selecting for men expecting better results, only to be hindered by that very action. Now if we assume that skin changing is an X-linked gene, we also have an explanation for why Bran could be special. It could be that Bran has a condition called Klinefelter syndrome. This syndrome, which is a little more prevalent than one in a thousand, is caused by a failure of cells to split properly in early development. Essentially, a sperm or an egg gets an extra chromosome in it, resulting in a male getting an extra X chromosome from either the mother or the father. It could be that Bran has extra telepathic abilities because he has an extra X chromosome. Of course, telepathy being an X-linked gene is an irony that lays bare a problem with the entire story. A Song of Ice and Fire is a story of houses, which are based on patrilineal succession. And yet for a son to inherit an ability, one must look to the mother's origin. And so in a sense, perhaps this entire series is off a bit with its heavy focus on men. The Secrets of Craster's Keep, The Crimes of the Night's King, Blood Raven, The Abilities of Starks. We've been worried about Craster's father and whether or not he's Blood Raven, but Craster's father shouldn't matter. We've looked into whether or not the Night's King was a Stark, but perhaps we should be worried about the Night's King's queen and her house. And we've wondered about how Stark passing genes through the Lord's Right to the First Night. But it's not the Starks who are passing genes, it's their vassals. And in the end, the others do appear to be getting genetic material from somewhere. They do appear to be telepaths. They animate the dead. And so in our final part, we'll flip things around a bit and look for answers with the mothers. The Secrets of Craster's Keep will conclude in part five. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.